Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to continue our talk about uh, about re uh, containers for reproducible research today. And I'm going to be talking about a technology that actually works on top of Docker called Binder. Um, and a binder, let's, let's talk about what a binder actually is. So a binder itself um, is basically, call it a unit of reproducible research. So if I give you everything that is in a binder, you should be able to reproduce all, um, you know, all of the analysis that it contains. So what is in a binder? Um, often a binder starts as a repository, and we're going to investigate one in a second. Um, it uh, first contains, um, let's, let's kind of start at the bottom. Um, it contains like your code and scripts to actually run your data. So you can see that we've got uh, a few kind of different R files and we've got some R markdown files in this directory. It contains your data and hopefully this is organized in folders. And I'm going to show some slides from uh, Rory Blucher um, from this presentation we did on reproducibility, but we'll talk more about that in a second. I'm going to make this bigger so everyone can see it. Um, finally, there is what's the so called the software specification. So this is where you specify which software packages and which versions of those packages you want the person to install. Um, uh, optionally, there's also um, a um, there's also metadata that you may have to kind of incorporate. So oftentimes we need need to incor incorporate things such as database annotations. So um, you may include these, or you may just include uh, the version of the database that you use. Um, and uh, we'll look a little more at this notebook here. So this is actually a reproducible notebook that Rory, um, me, and the rest of the um, dermatology team, um, or uh, head and neck cancer team, um, basically put together for this paper. So like I said, a binder usually lives in a repository, usually, uh, usually GitHub. So how do we use a binder? So this is a nice um, diagram um, that kind of explains like the, the general workflow. So um, basically, you know, someone such as Jane has written a paper based on her experiments and she wants to make sure that anyone can reproduce, check and improve her calculations. So these might include figures, these might include tables in, in her, um, in her manuscript, and she wants to make sure that people can uh, reproduce these. Um, so what she does is, and this is this is a little different than what we're going to be talking about, but she's basically going to describe her experiments in a Jupyter notebook. So it has um, all of those kind of literate programming tips, uh, literate programming kind of things that we are used to. So not only like do you have code, but you also have prose explaining what the code is doing and any visuals, um, also the resources. So this part, this is, this is kind of the bind, this is making the binder portion. When she, she has that, she's going to publish them to a publicly hosted repository. Um, so these are kind of some options. The most common one is GitHub, but you can also use other uh, alternative repositories such as Bitbucket and GitLab. And to make it what is called binder ready, she basically has some way of describing the software required to run the notebook. So the main way you do this is by providing a configuration file and kind of keeping everything in kind of a very organized fashion. So I'm going to show you um, exactly, because this, this is going to seem very abstract, um, but I'm going to kind of show you a real world example of that in just a second. So once you've kind of have this um, repository with the, so with the software specification, you can push a button that says um, run binder. <laughs> and I'll show you that button in a second in an example. And um, what that does is basically it, um, compiles a Docker container with all of that software um, and includes not only your data files, but your scripts. 
And so you'll see in a second that we'll, we'll be able to open up a, um, a Docker container or basically an RStudio instance. But in other cases, it might be a Jupyter Notebook um, or other kinds of software. I've actually run um, Shiny apps off a of binder as well. Okay, so I'm going to go down to go, oops. I'm going to go down to this link right here. Um, shoot, where is it? Okay, so it is this link under specifying a software environment and a binder. So this is a what's a binder project that Rory has um, uh, has nicely put together. And so this was part of a presentation that we gave for BioData Club called a Practical Guide to Reproducible Papers. Um, so if um, if you're not familiar with GitHub, again, it is a way to kind of share code, but this is kind of a way to share code and data and output. So let's kind of talk about uh, the kind of general structure. So you can see that she has uh, one R markdown file in the main directory, and it's just called binder setup example.rmd. And if you just look at this, this is a normal R markdown document, um, but there are some kind of nice things that she's kind of done to set this up. Um, so here she's basically reading in the data file and we'll talk a little bit more about the here package um, and how it kind of enables reproducible research in a second. But she is loading a, a, she's loading a file and then she's going to do some analyses with it. Um, and you can see these are the software packages that she's using for the for this um, for for the analyses. So dplyr, ggplot2, and here. So if we look in the data directory, you'll see that she has included um, this data file here. And what this is is, is known as a target interactions file. Um, it's a big file, uh, so I don't think we can actually look at it, but we'll look at it when we get into the binder. So there are two other pieces that are really important here, and we'll talk about kind of the, the way to kind of configure a binder in a little bit, but I want to give you kind of this guided tour. So the first, um, if you want to use this method to kind of install R packages, is a file called runtime.txt. And you'll see this only contains one line. And it specifies, you can see it starts with R. So this is the R version. And this is the snapshot that we, or the date in which this R version was kind of generated. And we'll go into what's called MRAN um, in a second. But this is basically where you're specifying what our project is running on. Um, and the second is this file called install.r. And so this, you can see here that these are all of the packages that we need to install into our software environment to reproduce this research. So we need both R Markdown, Knitter, and then we need those packages that in our R Markdown that we use in our R Markdown files. So dplyr, ggplot2, and here. Um, so this is a lot more, a lot, lot easier to, to use than something like a, something like a Docker file. You can specify a Docker file, but um, I, this is one of the strengths of Binder is that it makes this a little easier to kind of build these software environments. So if you look down here, um, wait, okay, so she doesn't have the button. Oh, there it is. So if you look at this button, there's this button here called launch binder. So I'm going to open it. And so this goes to a site called mybinder.org. And you can see that um, basically it, it's specifying, specifying some information about the repository and it's going to start building, building the Docker container. Um, in this case, I have already kind of built the Docker, uh, I built the, the Docker image. So this should just take a second to kind of load up. So I'm going to pause and I'll come back when it is ready to you. 
So while we're waiting, I just want to talk a little bit about, about what's going on in the background. So what we're actually doing is by specifying this URL, and I'll show you how to build this in a little bit, you are giving people like a link um, that basically utilizes the repository that Rory built. And it is using running this um, on a computational infrastructure called mybinder.org. And this is actually a technology developed um, by Stanford and actually all of their data science classes run off of it. Um, but um, it basically allows you to um, specify a, repos a repository link and basically launch a computing environment on the mybinder.org infrastructure. So these um, uh, basically, there is um, donated compute time for this. So it is kind of free on your end, but it's actually um, donated by people like Google Cloud um, that donate the, the time for this kind of reproducible software environment. So we're still waiting, but I'm going to pause until we kind of get going. Okay, so now we are um, running, this is actually an RStudio instance that is running on the mybinder.org uh, computing infrastructure. And if you look here, so we've got um, all of the files, I'm just going to raise this up. We have all of the, the files that were in our repository. So what I'm going to do is I am going to open this R markdown file. And if we did our job, or Rory did her job, um, we'll, we now have all of the software installed into our studio that we need to reproduce our research. So I'm going to run this code chunk right here. And again, I'm going to load in the data file. So this is called full drug target file. And you can see that we've now loaded in our, our, our data file that we wanna do our analyses on. So if I just click on that, um, this is just kind of an example. And so this is a summary of drug tar uh, drugs and their uh, purported targets. So for example, this is a drug called uh, vimorafenib, vimora, vimora, um, and you can see that these are the gene targets that it, it's targeting. Um, and so you can notice, uh, another thing to notice is that there are these different sources for, for the um, databases where we're getting this information from. But the main thing is that we can load this file in and we can now do some analyses with it. So she's just showing here, this is just the, the head of the full drug target file. So now she's doing um, a, a simple summary. So she's going to um, just look at what drugs exist in the file. So she's basically going to um, take our full drug, it, drug target file and she's just going to pull out this column and then just uh, arrange, arrange them in, term, uh, in alphabetical order. So if you see this, once she does this, you can see now that we've got this list of 137 drugs that were in the database. So now she's kind of continuing on. So she's saying, let's look at a drug called um, van, van de, Vandetinib. And you can see that she is filtering um, for that drug and that all of the, um, the targets, so it's just called Vandetinib targets. And these are all of the, the poten, uh, putative targets. So now she's doing some uh, she's doing some further filtering. Um, so the IC50, let's see. So she's basically filtering on the assay type and she wants the, the assay value to be very strong. So now she's doing some ad additional filtering here. And then now she's kind of producing a, she's producing a, a plot using this filtered. So that's the basic tour of the binder. So I'm gonna go back to the slides just a second. So 
We'll be, um, so like I said, you can share your analyses in multiple ways. Um, the ones that I've used are a Jupyter notebook and our studio project. Um, I've actually, uh, you can actually run shiny applications off of the mindbinder.org infrastructure. So there are some limits. I mean, this is basically donated compute time. So you are limited to one gigabyte memory and 40 gigabytes of disk space. Um, so that is kind of the limit of the mybinder.org uh, infrastructure. Um, but there are, you can set up your own kind of binder, um, binder uh, service and you can, you can point people to it and you can run analyses off of that. So let's just talk about um, sharing some code in the repository. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to switch over to Rory's talk here. Um, just a second. So Rory did a great job in this talk. Um, and again, this link is just in that um, in the in the repository that I pointed you out to. So she's just talking about kind of how do you organize files in a project? And this is, um, something that took us kind of a long um, time to kind of learn this this kind of standard structure. But if you set up your projects from the beginning with this kind of structure, um, using something like our studio projects or um, using kind of relative paths, um, putting all of your data and scripts into the same folder, um, you'll be a long way to getting your um, project as reproducible. So here she's just talking about like, you know, our like our our binder for that um, or our yeah, our binder for that uh, project, that paper that we were working on um, actually lives on GitHub. So she's just mentioning that it's great for project management and that um, it is open. Uh, so it is kind of nice. So it's uh, not necessarily tied to a particular institution group. So this one actually our, our paper repository actually is tied to um, Shannon's BioDev organization, um, but you can add collaborators. Um, and then, you know, once this kind of is out there, it lives as part of your research portfolio. So just kind of talking about the general parts of uh, project organization. So I think these are great tips. So I'm really just going to kind of stick to it. Um, part of, you know, in like, you know, you may have a bunch of files and scripts, but part of it is really thinking about how are you going to communicate like how the workflow works. And so this is kind of a great figure that was done by, um, I believe, um, that people in the head and neck cancer group. And it's just talking about the general workflow for our paper. So we start with a cohort, and this is the kind of data that we're using, somatic mutations, clinical data. We're dividing our data into, into subsets. So we're looking at um, HPV positive. So the H, any people who have had the HPV vaccine, or, or sorry, the HPV virus, um, who are considered HPV virus or positive or negative. And the reason why this is important in head and neck cancer is that these phenotypes present very differently from each other. You can see we are also pulling in pathway information from um, the Reactome database. And we combine this information to produce what are called um, head and neck cancer enriched pathways. Um, we do an additional step. Um, so this is uh, uh, Rory's works, which is like the cancer targetome, um, which is a database of like putative drug targets. And she's done a lot of curation with this. And so once we have these pathways that are enriched for head and neck cancer genes, we can actually um, ask the question of whether these tar pathways are targetable by current, gene current, current drugs. And so we, we have sorted them out into what are called light and dark pathways. So light pathways are pathways for which we have some sort of drug and they're, they're considered targetable. And the dark pathways are, some, are pathways for which we don't have any particular drug. So, um, so here she's just talking about in, in the, the, the structure of the repository, using these diagrams as kind of a project overview. 
And in the main um, repository, there is a file called readme.md. And so this, is, this will always show up when you go to the repository. Um, and so it outlines all of the information about our analyses. Um, kind of the next step is really kind of really codifying um, what goes into your what goes into your analyses, um, the steps of the analyses and the output. So what she's doing here is basically so we have um, these are the in key input files um, into our into our database or into our analyses. So this is um, from our the cancer genome atlas um, and this so these these are. Um, and then we need to do this kind of subsetting, kind of ex, um, external to our database. We need to pull in all of the p pathways. So th these are the inputs to our workflow. Um, so this is a great paper by um, uh, Greg Wilson and Je Jenny Bryan. Um, so it's called Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing. Um, so this is a great kind of, uh, this is a great kind of paper to kind of guide you into kind of organizing, um, organizing your, your files and projects. So she's talking about this is our, this is our input data set, um, the, the cancer genome atlas, head and neck, squamous cell carcinoma uh, co cohort. And so she's talking about, um, you know, what are the best practices? So when at all possible, if you can include the actual data files without protecting um, protected health information um, to include them in your project. The next best, um, this is this is less ideal, but if you can link to the public repository where data can be downloaded and include a part of your script, um, like how do you download that file? That's kind of the next step, next best. Um, and this often is the case when you have huge um, files that you can include in your repository. So here she's just identified the other resources that we need in our analyses. So let's talk about the project structure. Um, so this is, I, I think this is kind of the most important part of it. Um, so she's talking about like having these kind of subfolders in your project. So, and this, these are just kind of the conventions we use, but we find that this works really well. So you can use data, um, so if you have a data, um, any of your data files, like not only your raw data, but your clean data and any of the resources and annotation files can live in here in this in subfolders within the data folder. So she's um, talking about having a separate folder for analyses. So she's called an R, R file. And I'll talk about kind of making your analyses portable in just a second. And then she's got an output directory. So this is where, when you actually run the run the analyses, where the final figures and tables are generated to, and saved to. So now she's talking about like the key analysis steps and reproducing our our um, analyses. So. She's really focusing, she's um, part of it is really kind of focusing what are the main scripts used in analyses. So when you are doing analysis, you're going to generate a ton of kind of exploratory scripts, but you really want to stick to the basic, the main scripts that you are used in the analyses. And here, this is a very kind of iterative thing. So you want to make sure that they run and that the input and output files are very clearly described in your analysis scripts. Um, uh, again, like putting any kind of packages dependencies at the top of your scripts so people are aware of what packages that people need. Um, helpful commenting, so don't uh, underestimate this. Um, and I always say comments are not only useful to other people, but they're useful to your future self. So more comments, the better. Um, this all, again, this all lives in your GitHub repository. So once you kind of have it at this point, um, she's pointing out that this is a good time to show it to somebody um, who might not be familiar with the analyses and take them through it and see if there are any kind of gaps. Um, this is a link to our open sci. This is a great uh, science organization. And like, if you have software kind of attached to analyses, 
they do, um, you can submit it as a package, an R package. There's also R open Pi that started. Um, so if you're developing any packages, these are, they um, provide code reviewers and suggest things such as tests to make your software stronger. So I did mention about like the idea of making your, um, your projects portable. So this is um, the this is like the strength of something called the here package. So what the nice thing about this is that um, it uh, when you load the here package, it looks for the R proj file. So and everything that you're you, you, every file that you're specifying in your analyses is relative to where this R proj file is. So this is kind of the equivalent of using kind of set WD, but this works reproducibly across all of any system. Um, so here's kind of an example. So she, she's in a project. Um, you attach the library using library here. Use the here command to show you what the root directory is. And in any of your analyses scripts, it's going like no matter where you put them, and this is important, is that it's going to if you use wrap the the file path in the here command, it's always going to act um, as if your your root folder is um, where your R project file is. Um, this is especially important because this is a way this works across systems, um, and this is a, like kind of a key. Um, way to kind of ensure reproducibility. So again, she's talking about um, she's talking about putting her the files in an R folder. But if you just put your files in kind of the root directory, you don't necessarily have to use here. So talking about separating out separating out any sub analyses. So this um, this is kind of the majority of the analysis. Um, talking about kind of um, are there kind of similar sub analyses and of course and in our case there are because we're reproducing this analysis uh, not only on the HPV positive but also on the HPV negative. Um, this is a really nice um, thing to think about, um, especially when you are dealing with patient populations is really having the breakdown of kind of each of the um, analysis steps. And so, like I said, in this case, um, so like, you know, um, we are kind of assessing the different, um, the different kinds of alterations in our, in our data. So we've separated out our mutation and copy number an analysis. And then we basically um, look for these kind of, um, and we separated our light and dark pathways by mutation. And again, light pathways have some sort of, uh, they have some sort of drug target and dark pathways don't. And we've separated these out into the different kinds of um, genomic alterations. So here we were looking at just somatic mutations. So these are considered kind of point mutations. And here we're separating it out into copy number alterations. So these are kind of structural variations um, in our data. Finally, talking about the key outputs, um, this might be by figures. So here she's just talking about, you know, where do all of my figures and tables come from? So these are created within R scripts. Um, and then, uh, so these ones are, these figures were directly created within R scripts. So, but sometimes you have to take the data and you have to take it into like a, a software application. In this case, this was um, done with uh, Cytoscape and also a plugin called Reactome FI Viz. So we try to document that as best as possible. There's not really a way to script these currently, but we try to document the process of creating that figure as much as possible. So this is a very nice thing to think about is really, you know, showing where the, the key outputs are. Um, so she's basically added links in the, in the readme file to the um, exact locations of the, these different um, output files um, in, our, in our repository.
So I have walked through the R Markdown notebook, but I'm going to just kind of wrap things up and talk about our, um, I'll, I'll show you like the, I'll show you the head and neck repository paper, so. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I realized I was pausing the screen sharing, but I wasn't pausing the uh, recording. Um, so just in talking about kind of how do you specify a software environment? Um, so there are, um, these, these are the three methods that I'm going to talk about. So we talked a little bit about the install.r and runtime. Um, and so the nice thing about this, this repository here is that Rory has made it a template. So you can actually make your own version of this, pro this um, project. And again, this is an R-based um, analysis. So you can use this as a template to build on. But if you use Conda to install your software, there's an example in which you can basically generate one um, using a Conda, an environment.yml file. Um, and so if you go to this, this link here, this is an example of using an environment.yml file. Um, and so this is just a way to kind of specify, you know, what are the dependencies and um, channels. So um, there is a nice link um, in here that talks about um, how do you kind of generate these. Um, and that is right here, if you just in this three different methods. The other way is using a requirements.txt file. And so this is a link to that. So before I get back into the, the our, our binder, just want to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned um, in setting this up because it did take a lot of work. Um, so it does require a lot of distributed expertise. So um, this was an analysis that was actually done before I joined this group. Um, so we had to track down, you know, the original people who were doing the analysis and make sure that the actual um, the actual uh, analysis was reproducible. So one thing, so uh, the the notebook and the container is not. Perfect. So this this actually this analysis requires more than the one gigabyte of memory that um, that Binder gives you. So please don't tell me that you this doesn't work. <laughs> I'm aware of it. Um, so, uh, um, but at least you know you can take this into your own system. You can install repo to Docker, and you can basically run this container. Um, the code here you'll see it's extremely messy. That's okay. The main point is that it's reproducible, not that it's perfect. Um, this is what took the most time was making sure that all of the software was correct and it was reproducing the analyses. Um, so on my part, it required a lot of crying and frustration, but once we got it up, it, it works. Um, so just to, to be aware that this is kind of the latest, greatest technology, so it can be break um, based on kind of the version that you're running on. And try to version software during, using version tags. So I just want to show you how you set, how you can, how you basically get that link. Um, so here we're going to, I'm just going to take this, this link here. And if you go, um, so this is a link to the repository. And if you just go to mybinder.org, it will require you to put in the repository name. And this is the actual link. This is the actual binder link that you want to share with people. Um, so this is, uh, this is what will, will generate, um, open the mybinder kind of software environment um, for you. 
actually, we've actually gone through most of the head and neck papers. So I'm going to basically stop it here. So again, we just really wanted to kind of introduce you to the the main concepts um, of a binder and kind of show you how how they they kind of work. Um, there's no assignment attached to this because again, this is a kind of a new thing. So it's kind of hard to figure out a good assignment for this. So, anyways, thanks for sticking through with this lecture, and um, this will be up as soon as I can. <laughs>